Why don't, we, why don't we go to the piece by Stravinsky that you programmed for us? Mm -hmm. We have queued up uh, Igor Stravinsky's Concertino for String Quartet, arranged for 12 players.
mean it's mean when did you start encountering stravinsky's music was that in high school was that it in, in, in actually no. actually no um the the teacher the band teacher that i had in junior high was a dude that played in the uh city ballet huh. so um i heard lots of Stravinsky that they played but it was more like their period of contact with Stravinsky is a little later so a lot of the Stravinsky that they play is 12 tone music and sounds like you can hear that it sounds like Stravinsky but it's not this period and um so I you know I listened to that for a while and then around the time I was in high school into college, I started listening to a lot of Coltrane and somehow the Coltrane and the Stravinsky just came together in my head what the game was and that you could entertain with bitonal moments, that you could entertain with dissonance, that you could entertain with it. it was such a concept, it was so, it was like another level of, of relating to music that you could step back from, from the norm and do something as, as different as that. I just, I think my first year at NYU, I did a year at NYU and I was, so I was still living at home. I was 16, still living at home. I graduated high school when I was 16 and, uh, I used to go to the Ten Palace mm. and I would hear people that were kind of playing in a post Coltrane way. And then I heard this recording that we played um, at the NYU library. And just one day, I, it just all got, you know, polytonal, it, it just all got put together for me. And this was my music. This was the music that that really would shape the rest of my life. And that was the recording. And then I bought every recording I could of Stravinsky conducting his own music, which in the early 60s until he died, um, CBS Records decided to re-record everything that he'd done in stereo. And um, I, I still have all of those records, you know. Um, I remember at a certain point after I dropped out of NYU, I was working at a McDonald's on 42nd Street and there was a Sam Goody across mm -hmm. the street from the McDonald's. 43rd and Lex, I think there was a And Sam I would Goody. just take the money that I earned in Sam Goody's and I would buy nothing but Stravinsky and Coltrane. Wow. 
it was just, it, it just, my whole understanding of music was really deepened by those two influences. And, and certainly my understanding of what's happening in both modern classical music and modern jazz um, really came out of that period. Another piece that I picked, Chim Chim Chiri, uh, is another one of those records that I've transcribed and studied and taught the solos in those records because they just do, they do what George Russell is talking about. They do that. Um, and it, it, my, my ability to analyze those musics really increased when I started studying with George Russell. That was really, for me, I had an idea about how to do it, but I didn't have a, a, a hearing and writing discipline to do it with. And George really, you know, I'll always love him for providing that for me. Because he really, it wasn't just that he had a, a theory. It was all based on the overtone series and he really heard that way. So he could tell you how he was hearing something, which is different than somebody telling you how to do something. He told you how he, how he is the combination of how he was perceiving it in his brain and how he was hearing it. That was what he gave as a teacher in, in a very unique way. He was, in many ways, he was more a theorist, but he gave me um, the tools to analyze the Stravinsky and Coltrane and then other things. Um, so just a, a quick note. So w w during this uh, period at NYU, going to hear music at the Tin Palace, being around Greenwich Village, it sort of coincides with the uh, real influx of people from St. Louis, Chicago, Los Angeles, the so-called loft jazz of the time. Yeah, I heard, I heard plenty of loft jazz. I heard, I heard Woody Shaw at, at, at Holly's Holly. <laughs> I remember that quite vividly. I, yeah, I used to go to Ollie's and um, some of the other lofts and the Jazz Forum. What was, that, was that called a Jazz Forum on Broadway? Like And Bleaker. Bleak, bleak, jazz Broadway Forum. Um, I, you know, because those, those things were just around the NYU neighborhood. I certainly went to the Vanguard, but I was going to the Vanguard in high school <laughs> here in Betty Carter and Bill Evans yeah. and Joe Henderson and Bad and Mel. Bad and Mel, yeah. Um, well, which should we go to next? You, we, uh, you, the Stravinsky piece was composed in 1920, right? Maybe we should go to Pichinguinia now. Oh! The piece you, you have from him is 1919. <laughs> okay, yeah. Can we yeah. do that? Well, All right. I'm always up for that. Well, let, let's let's do uh, the piece by Pichinguini, and then you tell us about it after after okay. we hear the selection. It's called Lamentos. <laughs> Thank you. 
that is so amazing. You know, um, that really sends chills down my spine. You know, when you hear something that's so hip and modern for its time that is still burning at you, you know, like you get that with Louis Armstrong. Like you can hear some something that's as old as the hills and you can hear the, the edge in it. And uh, I particularly love Pichinguinha um, with a big band that he completely um, orchestrates. He's just so good at it. You know, there was a period where he was kind of like the Thomas Dorsey of one of the recording companies down there where he was putting together big groups behind singers and stuff. And he's just, he's just my guy, you know, he's my favorite black composer of the Americas. One of them, I mean, he's, for me, he's right there with Duke Ellington, you know, Henry Threadgill, you know, he's, he's, he's just such a, there's always something in a Pichinguinha tune that's, it's a point of experimentation. There's always something that's like, everyone has something you he's kind of well, let me see if i can do this with that you know it's he's just so lovable as a composer in in the way that stravinsky is lovable he's just it's just right there you know it's not idiomatic music it's it's um it's somebody that's just putting it together for themselves piece by piece but with a, a kind of compositional meticulousness he's very meticulous the way that he writes the endings the the phrasing the all the notes of his melodies that and counter lines when he stopped playing flute and he started playing tenor which is a loss for the flute but the counter line then you could even see that more than half of what he's doing is like everything has a counter line everything has counter lines counterpoint you know, the amount of music you would have to absorb to write like that. You know, there's lots of choro that I like. It's an it's a nice idiom, but it ain't all that like that. It ain't all like that. This is something different. This is a man who is a composer in the purest sense. He's right there with Verez. You know, if we talk about Latin American composers, he's there with Verez and and um you know, certainly somebody like Via Lobos. You, there would be no Via Lobos if it wasn't for Pichinguinha. Everybody studied him. Everybody, but just his bravery as a composer. I just, I just love him. I just, I just love him. Just really love him. Yeah. Well, Don, you said uh, when we were talking about Joe Henderson that. Uh, one thing, one consequence of immersing yourself in Joe Henderson's music was that you yourself realized that you would have to have a lot of different attacks, come out of a lot of different uh, uh, styles or ways of approaching music to have a career really as a, as, as a clarinetist playing the kind of music that you wanted to play. And I think you really start to apply that uh, in once you come back from Boston to New York in the, during the 1980s, I mean, I, I, I'm assuming that coming back to New York is when you join Mercer Ellington and when you play yeah. with Machito. You start for, at, at, you know, by the end of the 80s, you're playing with Ralph Peterson, you're playing with Bill Frizzell, you're playing with Uri Kane, you're playing Mark with Rebo. Bobby, Mark Rebo, a lot of the people for, of whose records with you and your records with them, we really start to know you for during the last decade of the century. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you, we can telescope that process a little bit. I, 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 I'm interested in, in one thing that interests me, you can talk about it or not, is uh, the extent to which playing Ellington's music influenced your composing or had an impact on your composing. Uh, the, the totality of being inside that music and being inside the Machito charts, if that, if that impacted you. But I'm also interested in the culture of New York, of New York music, you know, as the 80s progressed and, and, and during the early 1990s. Well, there's a lot of different things to address, but I'll just start with the Ellington band. 
Um, that's like one of the honors that I've had to play with Mercer. Um, you know, I was honored to do that gig. And, you know, if you're a black clarinet player, once you've played one of the two Ellington clarinet books, you've pretty much hit the top of what you can do in modern jazz at all, you know? So for me, um, I would have liked to have moved to the Jimmy Hamilton book, um, but I wasn't really wasn't playing any tenor at the time. So that didn't really happen, but um, I just couldn't, you know, I was just like, can somebody pinch me? And um, there were certain things that we played that I just, I just, um, but but it was once I I I could hear it too. I can't remember the name of it, but it was just one thing that we would play that I would just start tearing up. I was just so happy. To, it just. Don, you, you play some music, cut away and when, come back. One day, you know, my, my father had taken me to see the Ellington Band a few times because he was friends with Eric Dixon, who played in both the Ellington and Basie bands. And um, we played a concert at Queens College, and whoever was our in the Jimmy Hamilton chair didn't show up. And um, they said, well, somebody's got to play my song, you know. And it was just, my parents were there, both of them. I was just, I was just very honored to, to do that, to, to do it repeatedly, to tour with them, to have somebody black appreciate that I, that I had achieved enough on that instrument to play their music. Um, it was, I'm sorry. It was, it was the biggest thing that had happened to me in my life. Don, would you like to take a break and listen to some music now, or can we, uh, and and then proceed with? with where we were going to go. Okay. That, that sound good to you? Why don't we hear uh, something um, upbeat? How about the Eddie Harris? Sham time. Does that sound good for now? Okay. All right. Let's, let's hear Eddie Harris sham time. It's with uh, 67 with Jody Christian, piano, um, Melvin Jackson on bass, Richard Smith on drums, Ray Barreto is on it. And the horns include Melvin Lasty, Joe Newman, King Curtis, Fathead Newman, and Maywood Henry. Quite a quite a section for Eddie Harris, Sham Time.
beautiful. Eddie Harris, uh, sad time. You were talking before about um, Eddie Pondieri, other people, you yourself, I guess, subverting a form. I think Eddie Harris is a great example of um, kind of subverting, a, of, 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 of doing things that are totally within the function, but also, uh, but also doing, uh, Anyway, I don't know. I don't know where I'm coming from with that. But uh, I don't but, know either. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's just. But not, uh, I will say that, that um, getting into Eddie Harris um, really came after studying Lester Young, hmm. and Lester Young was a guy that really, in a way, they're very similar because Lester Young was deeply involved in the note bending and or ornamentation of black popular singing of his time, certainly through Billy. And yet he had this interval thing that he was working that was different than, you know, people were playing licks. They were playing blues licks. They had a few kind of straight ahead licks that they played. He could just decide to play force or fists or something like that and just entertain with that and um to me eddie i don't even think eddie's the next step i think he almost hyperbolated all of the points of what prez was getting at he became very involved in both studying r&b singing and singing himself but he could do all of those things on an instrument. But unlike somebody like Maceo or um, somebody like Maceo or Junior Walker, who was more singularly involved in that, he kind of kept the jazz thing very close to him. He kept a certain kind of experimentalness um, very close to him. He kept all the things that weren't supposed to go together. He, he kept them all very close to him, which I, th I think he's just very unique. He's another one of those guys, nobody's more in than him and nobody's more out than him. He's really um, brought a lot of things together. And another thing I should say about this and also, um, listen here, the classic listen here with the saxophone listen here that he recorded. Those are both Latin tunes. And when I was growing up, it wasn't like it is now with a Latin catch, you know, what's yours, what's what's yours is mine, and what's mine is mine. Like, like when I grew up, Latin music was a part of what soul music was. Soul music was the issue. And groups like Mandrill, who played funk and 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 Latin and Calypso, that the issue was soul music, and soul music was a thing that people wanted to be a part of, that Ray Barretto wanted to be a part of, that Eddie Palmier, you know, Boogaloo and mm -hmm. and Watusi and all of those things, mm -hmm. th those were to me a part of the umbrella of soul music. And when you look at a lot of stuff that we consider soul music, a lot of it's Latin, like um, The Ghetto by um, Donny Hathaway or Don't You Worry About a Thing by Stevie Wonder. These are integrations of you know, Latin rhythms into soul music. So I, I really think that it's really gotten away where, you know, like a whole bunch of Latin guys, they all have a thing because you're playing Latin music. We don't authenticize you. I don't, I don't feel that. I, I grew up with soul music and soul music was inclusive of a lot of different things of the diaspora. And that, that you know, Ray Barreto was made a lot of jazz records, you know, like all the party time and, all of those kind of jazz records. He's on jazz records, contributing. Yeah. And th what he did here, and, and what's interesting about this tune is, you know, 
other people recorded Sham Time. It's either Willie Bobo or, um, or Mongo recorded the tune, but none of them had the bass line. And the reason that they don't is because Barreto is playing the bass line. The only bass line that you hear on 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 that tune is him going beeble bub 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 boom beeble bub bub boom boom beeble. So when I covered it, I I put the Barreto bass line in there. I credit him with being the bass player of the tune. Well, you yourself about 10, 15 years ago did albums, uh, one devoted to Jimmy Walker's vibe, mm -hmm. and another with a real soulful church vibe, uh, the Love, Peace, and Soul record by the New yeah. Gospel Quartet, which I'm going to hold up here. And the Junior Walker do the boomerang is, is here. And you also in the 2000s did a record devoted to Lester Young, the study of Lester Young uh, called Ivy Divey, mm -hmm. uh, some uh, uh, um, navigating the context of Lester Young's trio with Nat Cole and Buddy Rich, that famous record, but then also some ensemble pieces with uh, Jack D. Jeanette and Jason Moran. But um, I want to step back because I, I would like to talk about your views on what was happening in New York during the time that you started to emerge with your voice and your sound as a key component of a lot of the music that was uh, was coming out at the time with the people that I mentioned uh, uh, maybe, maybe 20 minutes ago uh, with, with Ralph Peterson, with Bill Frizzell, with Uri mm -hmm. Kane, with uh, Clark Rebo, with the Black Rock Coalition, all these this music that really kind of was exploding about 30 years ago, and mm -hmm. that you were a, an integral part of. What was, what was your experience with that? Well, um, first of all, um, when I was in, still in, in, in New England, I had some roommates that were going to the museum school. They were art school types. So they were into a lot of like really scrunky rock and roll and they turned me on to like Arta Lindsay and Lydia Lunch and stuff like that. And, and I turned a lot of people I knew onto that music through them. That music was maybe as important as uh, Arta Lindsay, especially. Um, Arta Lindsay, James Chance, all of the, the groups that he was involved in, the first lounge lizards he was in, DNA. Um, I thought that that music really had something. That it, it in a way that was, it had what Ornette was getting at, but in a different kind of way. And um, I think when I met Mark Rebo, it was because we, we both could talk about By the Contortions as this great record that we loved. Um, but I think left out of the, the things that you were mentioning, I think downtown music, um, which wasn't the same downtown music that was happening at the Knitting Factory necessarily. Um, that, that was more like later. By that point, you know, Bardo was almost like semi-retired or something like that. <laughs> but I heard um, Ardo live. I'd never heard DNA live, but I did hear Ardo live while I was still in college. And a friend of mine that a guy that I went to junior high school with, Ralph Roll, who plays with um, with Nile Rogers these days, but he was playing with James Chance is still one of my heroes. And I was like, man, you know, like, what do people think it, you know, what are these guys thinking? And he kind of explained who some of these people were. Cause I didn't, I just didn't know that much about them and what they were thinking. But at the time that I was in school, you know, I would come down to New York and I would hear Latin music and downtown music. That was that you know I would hear some jazz of course if some the Philharmonic was playing something hot I would hear that but really what I was concerned with was hearing Perico at the Corso with Eddie Wawa and Eddie Martinez hearing some something like that that was just off the charts and hearing downtown music I was really 
I even had like a little downtown outfit. Like I, I went to one of the used clothing stores. I had a little shark skin suit with the little skinny tie and I would show up, you know, trying to fit in just so I could hear, not even trying to get in with people musically, but just to fit in so I could hear the thing and, and experience it. And um, I think that that music is really um, one of the contributing musics to what you're calling an explosive time that people miss. Um, also, uh, on my podcast, The Gory Details, we did an interview with Arto Lindsay, Frizzell, Melvin Gibbs, and Dougie Baum. All about, together or separately? Together, yeah, together. together. Wow. Uh -huh. You know, just really talking about, you know, all the things that Arto really contributed to the scene. He was really an important guy and a, and a great improviser for sure. A great improviser. He couldn't, couldn't even tune up to guitar, but he could really play. And um, so, but, you know, I always envisioned myself being able to do different things and that they would be on the cutting edge of whatever was happening, because that's what I liked. It wasn't just that I wanted to be seen around these people. It's just, it was what I liked. And um, I met Mark Rebo while I was rehearsing the Mickey Cats one day, because he had the rehearsal studio. He and Richie Schwartz, who also ended up playing with Mark Rebo, had the rehearsal studio at West Beth. Mm. And so we just met in the hallway and we were talking. And then the next thing I know, I was playing in the Rootless Cosmopolitans, just, you know, from socially, just realizing that we had things in common that we liked. Um, Ralph Peterson, I met playing with David Murray um, because a lot of people played in the David Murray octet who were not as far left as David Murray, uh, you know, um, Steve Coleman and Greg played the alto chair in the Murray octet. Um, a lot of different people play with David Murray, who went on to do mm. music that wasn't, you know, textbook black avant-garde music as it was defined by David Murray. But so I met Ralph Peterson. I think I subbed on the alto chair and we just looked at each other and said, well, you know, we could we could be playing together. And Craig Harris was there and he saw us playing together and he put us together in one of his bands. And, you know, the whole time that, you know, one of the main things about jazz in, in that period was that a lot of the old cats were still alive. And a lot of the old journalists, they weren't into giving it up to young black musicians. I mean, until Winton, Nobody thought young black musicians had any interest in jazz. You know, it was all, you know, we were we were supposed to be funk musicians or avant-garde. We could be anything but real jazz musicians. And um and and there weren't a lot of venues to play at because the old cats were still alive. You, you know, you were competing if you wanted to get into the vanguard, you were competing with the cats who had been playing the vanguard. Through, your, through my whole life. They were still playing the Vanguard. They were still playing Birdland. They were still playing those places. So, you know, you wanted to um, do something new, do something fresh. You wanted to make a contribution. And, you know, when a venue like the Knitting Factory opened up. Since 1987. You know, to me, um, the Knitting Factory really reminded me a lot of the Third Stream, which was the department I was in at New England Conservatory, where, you know, it was a combination of ethnic music, free jazz, different, you know, a lot of different things were under the Third Stream umbrella. And um, so that when, 
when the knitting factory opened up and it turned out to be a place where you could do a lot of different things, it was, it was very natural for me. Um, I thought, um, were you composing during this time? Another, your first record as a leader was Tuskegee Experiments, I think. Uh, and then, you know, a quick succession of, of things for none such in Blue Note. Were you composing for those projects or did you have a body of work already by 1990? Well, I think when I, when I got signed to, to none such, I was playing some gigs around town with um, Anthony Cox mm -hmm. and my friend Joe Berkovitz, who was one of my friends from New England Conservatory. And I think that's where Bob Hurwitz heard me live the first time. But I, you know, I was doing a lot of different things with other things and maybe more concerned. I was just surprised that I was surviving. You know, I was a guy that like, you know, every school I went to is just like, oh, nobody's, you know, nobody black plays a clarinet. What the hell is that? You know, so that I was surviving even was just, I was just kind of happy and shocked. And I wasn't really thinking as much about composing as surviving. Hmm. You know, both me and 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 Kenny Davis and a couple other cats, we were we were we were sub and substitute teachers at the New York City schools, you know, trying to survive. We used to, I'd be on a gig with Kenny Davis and we would tell horror stories of how, you know, a kid threw a knife at him and tried to kick my ass and you know shit like that that, you know, teaching in the New York City schools um, could be dangerous. Yeah. So, you know, once I had this kind of crazy um, group of things that I was doing, the Reggie Workman Ensemble, uh, Jerry Hemingway, Bobby Previtt, um, uh, Ralph, because Ralph, recorded before you know he really had his group before I had mine and when you know we we I think me, Ralph was very important for me because we both felt like we liked that the young lion stuff that some young black musicians were getting some notoriety for playing jazz but we thought they were too conservative we thought they were too conservative we thought that what they were doing was not as wild or as fun as a Blakey record like Free For All. Nothing that we heard out of Winton and Branford sounded anything like that to us. So that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to, and, and I think for me, I think the 80s and 90s were a very apolitical time in terms of Black Lives Mattering. You know, the 60s and the 70s, definitely the movement. The 80s, eh, you know what I mean? Not so much. So that, you know, if, you know, Train or Sun Ra was into the movement and that was fueling their music. Um, in the 80s, you really didn't have that. That's why I started focusing on a lot of the conservatives of color like Clarence Thomas, Shelby Steele, Dinesh D'Souza, because I felt like what I wanted to say, you know, because these were some of the only black political voices that you heard were these black conservatives. And what I wanted to say was that that shit ain't happening. And I let that politically fuel my music and talked a lot about those those people and their exploitation. Hmm. We have more music to play, but I, 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 I think we probably should talk a little more and play the last piece because we other, otherwise we'll be going over two hours. And All right. Probably well, a little I, more I've than probably the been talking too long, and you could. No, you've been talking. That. You've been talking eloquently, and I don't want to interrupt you. Well, let's talk about about Lenny Bruce and Sholem Stein. 
Okay, you want to do that and end with Lenny Bruce? Yeah, but you know, I want to talk about talk that. about Lenny Bruce and okay. And, I want to talk can, about what that thing is saying and how it relates to me. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's play the Lenny Bruce now. Okay. Then let's talk about what it's saying, and then play a fragment and talk a little while, and then play a fragment of something to to take us to take us out. Does sound okay. reasonable to you? Okay. okay. So we'll play the uh, we'll play uh, the Lenny Bruce bit. This is Henry Jacobs with another program of music and folklore. Today on our general <coughs> series of programs dealing with the origins of music, we're going to discuss the origins of calypso with a rather well-known. Hebrew scholar, Dr. Sholem Stein from the City College of New York. Dr. Stein has just returned from a trip throughout the Caribbean area where he's been collecting the examples of Calypso you'll be hearing in the background. Well, Dr. Stein, I understand that you feel that there are one time seems to have been a very significant Hebraic influence in the Calypso music of the West Indies. Is that yeah, that's, true? That's very true, Mr. Jacobs. You know uh, the um, the story of the wandering Jew, and we find uh, uh, the Hebraic uh, characters on world history scattered all over, even in as far away places as uh, Nassau and the Bahamas. Uh, well, now, you pointed out in the lyrics of this tune we're hearing now regarding tomatoes. Tom tomatoes, yes. We might listen to the words for a moment, and then you could comment on some of the content as you were doing earlier. Uh, yes, I, I, I would be glad to do that, uh, Mr. Jacobs. Uh, tomatoes. Let me find these. Uh, I have it in my briefcase here, the tomatoes. Uh, let's see now. Uh, oh, yes. Now... <clears throat> I will read it for you. You don't mind if I read it for you. Way, way down south where bananas grow, ants are stepping on elephant toes. Elephant jump with tears in his eyes. He said, why don't you mash someone your size? Now, Mr. Jacobs, this seems like uh, an innocent, uh, rather innocent uh, verse, but uh, comparing it with um, the uh, Mishnah. You are familiar with the Mishnah? Well, the Mishnah, one of the seven books of Moses, you yes, know, yes, yes. It is the third book. There's a similar thing there doesn't refer to bananas, of course. Uh, bananas were unknown in Jerusalem in, uh, in the, uh, the Old uh, Testament times, you know. Bananas, plantains. Well, what is plantains. the symbol here, would you say? Well, bananas, you see, and plantains is similar, football-like, more of a football-like... Uh, it, 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 the cosmos, you see, the cosmos, you know what I mean? Yes. There are scientific authorities today who uh, have shown us with uh, unerring accuracy that the world is, uh, the earth that is, as we know it, is not so much shaped uh, like, um, more like a football, you know. And uh, it uh, seems to be uh, maintaining its balance that way. Well, now, going on and on through the ages, you see. Dr. Stein, uh, yes. I understand that one of your areas of secondary interest is in the field of political science. Yes, yes, political and science. The, oh, yes. Uh, of course, uh, the picture in uh, Palestine has been of interest to you. Did you, you see I, that picture? No, doctor, I meant the picture in the oh, general. Oh, I see, I see. I, yes, the picture, the general picture in Palestine. Well, now you... Very menacing, yes, very menacing. It's, it's fraught with great danger for the entire world. Do you realize that uh, Israel is the pivot point of the Near East, and if that falls, the British Empire, the Suez Canal, consequently the Panama Canal, in fact, all canals, uh, international trade will be affected, and uh, the British pound sterling will go down. That will bring the value of gold up, and the ratio will be 
uh, thrown off balance to create uh, reflections even in the, the ruble, you know, the yen. Yes, it's a very profound subject. Economics, very interesting. Well, has there been any, do you think there'll be any interest in Palestine regarding this finding of yours? Uh, any interest in... Well, I'm trying to interest... Uh, uh, I'm trying to interest uh, Yasha Heifetz uh, uh, to... Uh, you know, Yasha Heifetz has a fine voice. I wonder if you know that. Uh, he, he commenced his career as a cantor in the Lower East Side, and uh, we are trying to... Uh, get him to sing in the uh, town hall uh, some cal calypso melodies, accompanying himself, uh, of course, on the guitar. He's a wonderful guitarist, you know. Well, this relationship, can you music musicologically uh, state the relationship between the calypso we're hearing and uh, uh, one of the Hebrew folk songs? Well, as I say, they all have their Old Testament base in the Mishnah. Yes, of course, we could trace that back. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you have traced it. Oh, right? yes, yes. Uh, I, uh, Of course, it's a complicated, uh, very deep, profound subject to go into now. I would, <clears throat> I would uh, uh, suggest that uh, you uh, recommend perhaps to your audience to read my forthcoming book, uh, entitled uh, Bahama Mama. Uh, of course, it, uh, Bahama Mama, it uh, refers to the uh, mother myth of the Bahamian Indians, you see, and how through their matriarchal society, uh, you see the connections with the, the subject at hand. And it goes very deep, very profound, <clears throat> and has international complications on the financial world as well as just any place. Well, understand you've been giving a recent series uh, before your last trip mm -hmm. uh, to the West Indies, a series of lectures yes. at the uh, Yes, New I have been giving those lectures at the New School for some time now, and they've met with uh, varied uh, <laughs> uh, comment from the audience uh, when, they, when the people came at all. Well, I understand you had some theories on the uh, psychoanalytic significance of music. Yes, of course. We all know that music is related to the psyche. For example, uh, what does the word psyche mean? You know, what does it mean? It means, it means the soul. Soul. And... Uh, what was the question again? Uh, would well, you the, rela the, the relation... Psychoanalytic uh, the relation with the, the, with the Bahama yeah. music, yes. Oh, yes, yes. Or well, music in general. In general, most more in general than specifically, I would say. And uh, my forthcoming book, Ma Bahama Mama, it takes up that subject. Goes into it very... I, I really feel it's a penetrating analysis, indeed, yes. Well, I suggest that uh, perhaps we listen to some of this... Uh Calypso music and uh, let the audience uh, perhaps draw their own conclusions and I'm sure they'll be interested in your forthcoming book. Bahama Mama, yes. By Bahama Dr. Mama. Sholem Stein Two dollars and City and 50 cents. You can find that in any bookstore. All right. I, you know, really what I wanted to talk about is my experience um, doing klezmer music and the unfortunate idea that people had that somehow klezmer music was jazz and that I was saying that. Um, I, I did a lot of interviews while during the period that I was working the Mickey Cats and every one of them asked me what the connection was between klezmer and jazz and I would say there was very little and not a one of them printed that. Not a one of them. And instead, I got associated with this kind of um, idea that klezmer music was Jewish jazz and that, that somehow me doing this music successfully was just this sign of that. Because the music was around for many years and, you know, none of these writers, Nat Hentoff and Gary Gins, they weren't writing about it, but somehow they got the idea that that for them 
it was kind of this Kunta Kinte moment that they didn't have to be self-hating about that. But it was all very much done both at my expense and at the expense of jazz being respected as a black music. Saying that jazz is a black music doesn't mean that other people can't be in it, but to say that like, you know, somehow every, every time you looked, somebody wanted to say or imply that like klezmer music had more to do with jazz than it really did. Um, klezmer music is Jewish Romanian music. If you know Romanian music um, and then you know some klezmer, um, you can see that that's what it is, but some of the scalar material, note bending and ornamentation that a klezmer musician would use is a little different than what a non-Jewish Romanian musician would use. But all of the early klezmers were born in Romania or the ones that, that count, which are Dave Taras and Naftuli Bronfen. Both of those, they're Romanian guys. And Taras in particular knew a lot of music of the region because he was playing the Eastern European region. So even after he comes back, comes to America to live, he's making Greek records. So the idea that somehow I would be saying that with my activity in klezmer music, I found completely offensive. And it made me look like a self-hating black man to a lot of black people who won't say that, but they have this little vibe about me that like, well, he's, I'm not really black anymore. Um, one, of, one of the things that happened to me while I was doing that music was um, I played my first um, Mickey Cast concert at the Knitting Factory. And I played a few more times in that year and then a year went by and then Michael Dorff decided that he wanted to do a Jewish music festival. So that would, that would be like if 1989 was the first time I did the Mickey Cats at the Knitting Factory, a year later, we did it again. We had a few nights and then all these, you know, everybody Everybody Jewish that was a downtown person seemed to have their take on it, even though they had never really thought about the music before. And I really include John Zorn in that. He hadn't thought about his Jewishness, much less Jewish music, until he saw the lines around the block for the Mickey Cats. So um, we did that and George Ween could smell something, but he also, wanted to do something with me. So we did this uh, one year, the Newport thing happened at this auditorium around Times Square and George Ween presented the Mickey Cats. We did the concert and he says, he calls me up, he says, man, you know, klezmer music and jazz is the same thing. And I said, nah, man it's not really the same thing. They don't really have anything to do with each other. And he said, you know, I've got an idea. I want to put you on and then I want to have some jazz and then we'll be showing it's the same thing. And I said, yo man, it's not the same thing. And we never did any business again because I wouldn't go along with the stupid idea that klezmer music was jazz, but a lot, you know, a lot of times I would be playing at places like the Vanguard and one of these journalists like Gary Gins would say, I'm, you know, I'm playing with Uri Kane and Smitty Smith and David Gilmore and they're saying in the paper, can't be retracted that I'm playing klezmer music. And that was really hurtful to me. You know, one, a lot of the, the club owners who's clubs I played at, they didn't like it and they blamed me for it. When I wasn't really saying that I was playing music, klezmer music all the time. And I certainly never said in a sentence, nobody can quote me saying that klezmer music is Jewish jazz or it has anything to do with jazz. But, but I think what really never really got conveyed 
was that what killed klezmer music in the 50s and 60s was that Jewish musicians didn't want to be associated with it. They didn't want to be pegged as some kind of ethnic guy that really couldn't play some American music. And so a whole generation of Jewish musicians, including Goodman, who never really played any klezmer. I mean, I don't even know where people get that. He never played any klezmer, but a whole generation or a generation and a half of Jewish American musicians just skipped that. And there are some exceptions like Sam Most, like Sammy Musiker. There's some exceptions, but for the most part, a whole generation or a generation and a half of Jewish American musicians didn't want nothing to do with that music. They wanted to be not off the boat, greenhorn types. They wanted to be American working musicians. Um, during the Mickey Katz, before the Mickey Katz period, when I was with the Klezmer Conservatory Band, we met with a, a guy that was a, a Jewish American agent. And he told us the story that he had a fist fight with his, his father-in-law the day that they met because his father-in-law dared to call him a klezmer, but he was in the Metropolitan Opera. That's more what the mentality was. You know, when uh, I remember I was playing with the Klezmer Conservatory Band and we played a benefit and, and Mel Lewis was there. And, you know, he heard us playing and he sat down and he he played, he could play that that music on the drums, but you you never heard him play that. It just wasn't done. And um I think what what all of this over Jewishing of me really accomplished is it took away some of my blackness musically for a lot of people. So I wasn't getting called for so many Hendrix tributes and shit like that. Um, people thought that I was really standing behind this idea that, that, that Klezmer musicians invented jazz or something like that. And I, you know, it, nobody in Klezmer music actually believes that. On the other hand, you know, after me, all of the Klezmer bands started playing jazz festivals. But still, I never really benefited from that. And, but mostly the, the idea that somebody would just kind of invent with no details, which is what Sholem Stein is doing here, inventing with no details, this concept that he has that somehow Calypso, and Calypso of all things, since I come from that too, but Calypso is originated in jazz, um, you know, it's a similar kind of idea. It's, it's revisionist. And, um, you know, there's nothing I can do to reverse that in my career, but I've, I certainly have never said in a sentence that those musics are even connected for me. I, the person that know, know how both of those music works, they don't really have anything to do with, with themselves. You know, my career could have been an example of saying, you know, a lot of black musicians could be doing a lot more work than the work that they do. And here's just one idiom that you'd never call a brother for. And, the, and somebody's doing a good job with it. You know, when, when I was a kid, there weren't that many blacks in Latin music, but there was John Henry Robinson, Skip Howlett, Willie Bobo, you know, I saw black musicians be versatile and do other things besides the one or two things that people think that black musicians can do. And it was in that spirit that I started playing klezmer music. You know, at, in New England Conservatory, if you were white, you could, you could pretend to be into anything and not be able to play it at all. I took up klezmer music and I actually could play it and understood it. So being good at it was something that nobody expected. But at the time I was a trained clarinet player and at that time, trained clarinet players would not play some non-classical music like klezmer music. Now it's in every, every, every young classical clarinet player's playbook. Now they, they wanna 
say I can play a little bit of klezmer. It was really wasn't like that when I started. They wouldn't have anything to do with that, especially if they were Jewish, especially. Well, Don, I think your career uh, and what you've done in the last 30 years is an example to many musicians that uh, black musicians can do things that they're not expected to do. You've recorded uh, so many different uh, idioms and the albums all have lives of their own and, and are all uh, very fully accomplished and very thorough. Dealt with the Afro-Caribbean sound, you've dealt with leader, you've dealt with uh, rhythm and blues and soul music and hip hop circa the 90s. You've dealt with so many different musics. And I, I, I think it's, uh, and currently you're dealing with very abstract music with Arawan Ortiz and the uh, amazing duo project uh, that you've been doing. So it's been a great career from my perspective. And I'm uh, honored that you spent so much time and uh, went so uh, deeply into the various subjects raised by the music that you selected. Mm. I'd like to thank you and uh, praise you for an amazing career and something, and I'm sure it's, and it's uh, probably got a long ways to go. Yeah, you yeah. know, barring accident. Barring accident, barring accident. Um, that, shall we end with Chim Chim Cherie? Yeah. All right. Should Tell I say something that, about it before? Say or? something about it before, but before you do that, say, uh, tell us uh, about your podcast one more time. My podcast is, is sponsored by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and it's called The Glory Details with Don Byron. And we've taped five shows, one with Stanley Drucker, who was the oh. uh, clarinist in the New York Philharmonic for 60 years, um, with Luis Perry Gortiz, who we spoke about, with Gary Bartz, with um, Ardo Lindsay, and then a, a group, a, a kind of wrap up show with three other African American clarinetists. Todd Marcus, J.D. Perrin, and Dwight Andrews. Hmm. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for those for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely. Uh, and um, one thing that caught my attention last year during the pandemic were this amazing series of posts that you put up on Facebook about your yeah. influences. Working on a book. You, went, you, went into, book. you are working on a book because a, a lot of people wanted to know that. Yeah. All right. Well, keep, keep me posted on that. Now let's talk I about Chim Chim Cherie. You want to say something? Well, what I can say wait, about wait a, yeah. before, uh, you know, when I played with Vernon, I became really aware Vernon Reed, of you mean. Vernon Reed um, of shredding. And shredding is something that, you know, guitar players do to get house where they're just kind of playing these 16th notes and they don't have to be making any kind of sense. You know, it's just like, you know, like even like the, the way that the guy shreds in Spinal Tap where he's just running his finger down the neck. Like a lot, a lot of people shred like that. This is what shredding would be if there was content in it. <laughs> that the other thing that I wanted to speak about and the reason that I had some art to Rubenstein queued up that we didn't get to was that there's two ways of approaching rhythm. One is to be on the rhythm and one is the second is to be off it on purpose that you can play four beats ahead of time and wait for the next beat to come around or four beats and play it a little behind the beat and then catch up. And both Joe Henderson and Train are good at playing a lot of notes in a, in a kind of more wobbly rubato kind of rhythm, rhythm that they really control. Joe Henderson also could play on a quarter note triplet. He could play 16th notes on the triplets. He could do many things that you more associate with 
an elven type of drummer that he could do those things. Train could do those things too. You know, both Train and uh, and Joe Henderson could divide the beat into fives, sevens, all kinds of uneven, more new music sounding divisions that aren't just twos and threes. But um, this is, is, if shredding was really what it ought to be, it would sound like this. It's, it's one of my favorite and most studied solos uh, of, of Gold Train. And I just think he's at his height. Um, he, he's just at the height of his creativity. And, and yet there's so much theory to what he's doing. You know, when you, when you really see what he's doing and what he's getting at, is it kind of Locrian or is it minor? You know, like all of these kinds of, of kind of choices that he makes that are just exquisite, clever, and really look good on paper, you know. Is, is, you know, in this period, what he's doing looks like Bartok on paper. Very similar. John Byron, thank you so much. It's been fascinating two hours. And um, we'll end with John, John Coltrane, Quartet, with McCoy Tyler, Jimmy Garrison, and Elvin Jones from 1965. Uh, Chim Chim Chui from uh, Mary Poppins, right? Yeah, Mary Poppins. yeah, yeah, you know, and, you know, in, in the about, like, the, you know, playing some music that isn't like jazz you know For like sure. I, sure. bye bye blackbird isn't jazz either it's nor was my favorite things or nor matter. was my favorite things you know these aren't these aren't jazz tunes well now they are because now of, they are <laughs> because of coltrane anyway this has been uh the first uh yeah it's iteration of desert island discs for our seventh season the 2021 2022 season and thank you so much don byron yeah, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you.